Hello, everybody. I figured that my last episode should be my strength, which is programming. So I've made this tutorial level, and this tutorial level will teach you how to make your ships cool using programming. Uh, now, this is a tutorial on how to do things like complex triggers, uh, powerful buttons, and uh, timer blocks, and uh, monitoring stations, and all sorts of other stuff that might be really useful to you. Now, if you're not a C-sharp programmer, you might be going, oh my gosh, that sounds complicated. The whole point of this tutorial world, you don't have to be a C-sharp programmer. It's a pretty straightforward thing to do without any C-sharp programming at all, and this tutorial will walk you through it in baby steps. I'm going to walk you through it in baby steps as well, but you honestly don't need to watch the video, you can just go get the world. So here we've got these doors, and we can't get through, and it's sort of like a puzzle, except for it's a baby puzzle because it tells you exactly how to solve it. The idea is that this programming block already has Mimir in it, and Mimir will get run whenever you tell it to be, to be run. And over here we have a button, and we say, well, you should make this button run Mimir with that particular argument. And the idea is you are going to learn a little bit about what Mimir can do. Now the secret to this is you're also learning C-sharp. Uh, while obviously star door dot open is not valid C-sharp, it teaches you some of the fundamental concepts that are going to be useful to you when you do get your feet wet with actual code. But you don't need to know any actual code or even learn any actual code or do any actual code to get a lot out of this. Uh, as you can see, this doesn't require any actual code. It works with stock Mimir, and you can already see how you might be able to use it to make more powerful ships. To, just to demonstrate, this is you just make this by selecting Mimir, selecting Run, and then typing in that argument. Like so. And now when I hit the button, all the doors open. Oh, well look, that door over there, door over there closes. Hmm, that's odd. Well, let's go ahead and put this back, just in case someone wants to play with it later. And let's go back over here. Now this door went up, so if you've been following along, you'll, your way will be blocked by this door. Well, now is when I will teach you a little bit about how Keen does things, because the real complexity of this isn't C-sharp, and it isn't Keen. It's the fact that both of them are involved at the same time. Keen's libraries are quite complex. Keen's calls are odd. For example, door.open does not open the door. It toggles the door's openness. But you can call doors with more, com with, with more complex triggers, like open underscore on and open underscore off. I've also created some more powerful uh, tools for you to use with Mimir, and here we're starting to get into the concept of a function that takes an argument. So you can have this screen display an arrow by telling it to display an arrow. The screen is named display. See? So you're saying display set image arrow. Pretty straightforward. And here you can see that Mimir actually prints out a log of everything you've done and everything it's done. And this is important because people tend to get a little bit scared of programming blocks. Well, programming blocks are just blocks, and if you select them, you can see that this is exactly the same thing that's showing up on the screen over here, except for they're, they're slightly out of sync because of the way that they get called, but it's the same basic idea. This is not something to worry about, it's not th something to fear. If you have a programming block, you can click on it and see what it has to say for itself. That's totally fine, you don't have to panic about it. And you can see that what we see here is it just says, door 1, 2, 3, 4, and final, open. That's what it did last time it was called. You can see here, we actually called it twice with that, so you can see that it, it just displays it twice. Now, because of things like open underscore on, uh, it can be very difficult for you to figure out which arguments you need. I mean, how do you know what to call a piston with to reverse it, or to extend it, or to retract it? How do you know what to call a light with? How do you know what to do anything with? Well, I've put in an analyze command so that you can tell Mimir to analyze any button you'd like. So if we were to go down to Mimir, and we type spotlight.analyze, you can see that it gives you a list of all of these actions you can tell it to do, and all of these properties. Please notice a lot of these are misspelled. I can't do anything about that. Keen misspells stuff a lot, and you're just going to have to misspell it the same way. Think of these as magic words. Um, if you don't know them, you're screwed. If you do know them, make sure to type them exactly. Everything will run fine. If you type them wrong, you're going to get errors. 
99% of the complexity of, of programming is the fact that you cannot type anything wrong. And that's made a lot worse in this development, in this, you know, if we're going to Mimir's code here, this has no, no autocorrect. There's no uh, tab completion. So when you type in here, you're going to have to be very, very careful. It's very easy to just forget a letter or accidentally spell something right when it's supposed to be spelled wrong. So then we can move on to the second phase here. This is the monitoring phase. And in this phase, you're going to set up a programming block called Mirror Monitor. Mirror Monitor is just a version of Mimir that runs automatically. Uh, and it will run a specific kind of special function. So you, with, this is where I teach you how to set up a timer block to call a programming block end itself. And that's a very common way to do things because these programming blocks only run when they're triggered. A timer block can easily trigger it and itself and just keep keep pushing it along once a second. Mirror monitor is actually a little bit more advanced than that. It will detect the nearest timer block and overclock it. And that allows Mimir, uh, Mirror monitor to run very, very rapidly. You can set Mimir up the same way, but I don't teach you how to do that. It's a little more advanced. Once you've set up your uh, Mirror monitor to run correctly, it's just a matter of renaming things to get your monitoring to show up. I guess I will set this up properly, just so that I can show you what I mean. So if we go into here, set up actions, we want to set up the Mimir timer to run and Mirror monitor to run and start. There you go. It's running once. Uh, oh, there we are. So now it's got this weird frozen appearance. That's because Mirror monitor is running faster than the frames update. So now if we go over here and we type status piston as the name, status semicolon piston. You can see that mirror monitor catches on pretty quick and starts to display the status of the piston relative to how far it is extended. See? And I teach you a little bit more about that. This is pretty straightforward. I just teach you the concept of a semicolon, which is to break commands. So this status, I want you to use rotor A, semicolon rotor B, and you can quickly learn that you can put multiple commands in just separating them with semicolon. I also teach you wild cards, which obviously are a little bit less useful in C sharp proper, but are very useful for your for your ship. And here you can see I'm doing another one, alpha open, beta open. This is to teach you that it's not just mere monitor that can take those. Any command can be separated by semicolons. So therefore, if you call Mimir properly, you can ha pass Mimir an arbitrary number of these commands with semicolons between them. Now here's where we start to get into the concept of actually programming stuff. And so this block here is just a very, very quick demonstration of how to find your way around a little bit in code. And all of those long commands we were typing into our buttons, I'm going to show you how to type them into the programming block. Because the programming block is easier to edit, you can keep track of text better, you can cut and paste into it easier, uh, and you can also just edit it. Whereas if it's part of a button or a trigger, you can't really edit that. You've got to like delete it and put it back in. Real pain in the ass. So this just teaches you the concept of cached commands and teaches you how to call them. It's very straightforward, and here I teach you to actually get your fingers wet and uh, change one of those cached commands. Hopefully it'll let you feel a little bit less nervous about how programming blocks work. They're just big places to stick all of your code, and you've been creating code for the past eight challenges. Here's where I start to teach you about triggers. Now triggers actually require you to run Mimir properly. And so what I've done is I've given you a tutorial on how to set Mimir up and what we're going to be doing with it and exactly which code to edit in which way and what it means. Now this might be a little bit complex if you've never coded anything before, but it should be fairly straightforward. You should be able to figure it out. It's not so challenging that it's uh, you know a pain. Uh, and I hope that it gets you interested in coding. Once you've gone that far, you already understand the very, very fundamental concepts of code, and it's very easy for you to just go ahead and uh, learn more. It's not one of those situations where it's hard to learn more. Uh, for example, once you've learned how to do this, uh, it's, it's uh, fairly straightforward to then go on and learn how a for loop works and use that to process any number of batteries. If you've got 46 batteries, you can make a for loop and process 46 batteries. It's pretty easy to learn how math works so that you can round your numbers properly. It's pretty easy to work how, learn how brackets work. So the idea is every single tiny little 
concept in programming can now be applied here in your game world. And that makes them a little bit more interesting, because, you know, in the past you would have to do something like, oh, you've been told how a for loop works, but you have no application for it, so whatever. It just goes in one, out, in one ear, out the other. You, you'll, you won't remember it because you don't have anything to do with it. But now, that for loop can let you monitor any number of batteries. Um, and that's an important thing to learn. It's an important way to learn. You can do a lot more with it if you, uh, um, if you do it like that. And that's the entire concept here. I'm hoping that people will take this into consideration, uh, try and learn it, and then when they're done, I think, I'm hoping that they will say, oh, well, a little bit more programming knowledge could really take this a lot further. So maybe I should learn a little bit more programming knowledge. <laughs> well, that was Space Engineers. According to Steam, I have played this game for 1,500 hours. I think that's probably enough. I don't think the game is suddenly bad. 1,500 hours is definitely worth the price of admission. And I think the devs are still trying to expand the game, so maybe it'll be even better in the future. But I'd like to focus some of that time on more useful pursuits, on development and tutorials. I don't plan to give up on spaceships. Even if I'm not playing Space Engineers, I am a space engineer, and you can expect that most of my games will take place up in the stars. Um, so I hope you'll stick around for development and tutorials and stuff, even if I'm not playing Space Engineers. Either way, thank you for joining me for 13 weeks of Fleet Breakers, and uh, I hope that you're enjoying whatever you happen to be playing and however you happen to be playing it. I've got a long vacation coming up, but after that, hopefully you'll see some more videos from me on other topics.